Welcome to Stonebridge. Here are some announcements and things to know. During this time of virtual and social distance worship, it's important to continue contributing to the ongoing ministry of Stonebridge. Here are the ways in which you can give. You can give online through our website at stonebridgecme.com. Click on online giving. You can give through your bank's bill pay option, or you can send in your offering through the mail. If you'd like offering envelopes sent to you, please contact the church office. Ventura County is now in the orange tier and more and more people are choosing to get vaccinated. Consequently, Stonebridge is entering the next phase towards reopening. Next week, we will begin meeting weekly for worship. Join us outdoors on Saturday nights at 5.30 or indoors on Sunday mornings at 10.30. Kids and teen programming will also be available during both services. Pre-registration is still required. Please register by Fridays at noon. Stonebridge's May reopening includes preparing our campus for welcoming back members, friends, and new guests. And if our church is a family, then our home needs spring cleaning. If you enjoy gardening and landscaping, have ever wielded a paintbrush or broom, or have general fix-it skills, then invest in Stonebridge's future by lending a hand. Let us know you'll be joining us by calling the church office. And lastly, we would love to know that you're participating in worship. Continue to share your news, prayers, and praises by emailing prayers at stonebridgecme.com. Or if you're following along in YouVersion, please take the time to fill out the e-connection card. You are an important part of Stonebridge's community of faith. Once again, welcome to worship. Hello and welcome to Stonebridge Online Worship. I'm Associate Pastor Jonathan Lucia. In worship today, Pastor John will be teaching on a story found in the Gospel of John, where a paralytic waited by a pool for 40 years to be healed. Waiting on the Lord is a common theme in Scripture. For example, in Psalm 27, verse 14, it reads, Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Or in Psalm 27, verse 7, it reads, wait patiently for the Lord and rest in him. Again, in Psalm 39, verse 7, it reads, and now, Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. In contrast to our fast food culture, where we desire immediate gratification, scripture encourages us to slow down exercise the virtue of patience and wait upon the Lord. Let our thoughts be centered on this singular idea today as we prepare our hearts for worship. Again, welcome to worship. safe within your name this we know this we know you promise never to forsake but you began you will sustain this we know this we know Say 
Like a covenant of old, your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon. There's mercy for today. Today's verse is from John chapter 5, verses 1 through 18. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate there is a pool, called in Hebrew Beth Zatha, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for thirty-eight years. 
When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, take your mat, and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath, so the Jews said to the man who had been cured, It is the Sabbath, it is not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, The man who made me well said to me, Take up your mat and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take it up and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Do not sin any more, so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore, the Jews started persecuting Jesus, because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is still working, and I also am working. For this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own father, thereby making himself equal to God. The word of the Lord. Hello, Stonebridge. I'm Pastor John, one of the pastors here at Stonebridge Community Church, and we are continuing our sermon series entitled Revealed God at Work, where we are looking at the signs that Jesus performs in the Gospel of John. These signs that Jesus performs, these aren't just miracles. They aren't just deeds of power. They're not just miracles that Jesus performs for their own sake. But these signs, they point us to deeper truths. Like signs that guide us along a road, the signs that Jesus performs, they guide us along the way of following Jesus. So we are looking at Jesus' third sign, which is another sign of healing. And as we turn to the scriptures and as we ask uh, for God to teach us, I invite you to join with me in prayer. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, teach us now through your scriptures. Teach us now through your word. Help us to see your work more clearly and help us to respond to your work more appropriately. Teach us how to respond to you well. We thank you and we praise you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Now, as I mentioned, Jesus' third sign, which is here in John chapter 5, this is a sign of healing. Similar to the second sign where Jesus heals the official son, this is a sign of healing where Jesus heals somebody. Jesus heals a man who has been laying by a pool for 38 years. This man is unable to walk. He can't move. And his belief, like many of the others who were in his area, was that if somebody were to enter this pool that he's laying by, after these waters start to swirl, that that person would be healed. They would believe that an angel or some sort of divine being was swirling those waters. So if they entered into the waters, and the first person who entered in, if they entered in, they would be healed. This man has been trying for 38 years to enter these waters, but somebody else always gets there ahead of him because he can't move. He can't walk. So how is he supposed to beat anybody else into those waters? You can sense the desperation from this man. Now, with him and with his story, there's actually been a fair amount of debate in the history of the church in response to this man and really focused on this man's response. Now, what Christians haven't really debated is whether or not this man deserves pity. He clearly does. This man would have had a very difficult life. For 38 years, he's been unable to walk, just laying there by this pool. What this tells us is that his family has abandoned him. He doesn't have a community. Anything that he would have eaten would have been based off of scraps that he would have begged for. This man has had a very difficult time. So he deserves our pity. Not only would he have not had a lot of food, not only would he not have had a family though too, his hygiene would not have been able to have been kept up. He would have smelled bad, which would have resulted in more people shaming him and more distance from other people. 
So every Christian reflecting on this story has agreed, this man deserves our pity. And Jesus gives him mercy and, and Jesus heals him appropriately. But where the debate starts to arise is when this man responds to Jesus. Some Christians have claimed that he responds in a positive way, that he bears witness to Jesus. But in recent years, Christians have begun to look at this story a little more closely and to look at some of the details and to compare it to other signs in the Gospel of John and to the outcomes of other signs in the Gospel of John. And when you do that, you start to get a more negative portrayal of this man. At best, it's ambiguous. Most likely, it's somewhat negative. This man is not how we are supposed to respond. But you have to look at the details in this story. So first, the man, Jesus comes to him. He heals him. After 38 years, he's now able to walk. But this man doesn't seem to care at all about who Jesus is or why Jesus did what he just did. There's no curiosity displayed here. And it may not seem like it sticks out, but compare this to other stories in the Gospel of John, where people respond with deep curiosity about Jesus. Compare this to the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, who asks all sorts of insightful questions. Compare this to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, who, though he doesn't understand what Jesus is saying, he's still asking questions. He's still engaged. There's no real curiosity here. I mean, we learn in the story that the man doesn't even learn Jesus' name. When they ask him who it was who healed him, he doesn't even know Jesus' name. And furthermore, Jesus has to go and find him in the temple. The man isn't searching for Jesus. He's not looking for Jesus at all. Jesus has to go and approach him. So there's really an odd lack of curiosity that the man displays here. Where it starts to be a little bit more of a negative portrayal is that the man, he's not actually really bearing witness to Jesus in this. He has been told by Jesus to pick up his mat and to walk. So he does that. And that's appropriate. He does what Jesus says. But the moment he's questioned about this, he says that the person who healed me told me to do this. He's not really bearing witness to Jesus because, again, he hasn't learned Jesus' name. He hasn't asked any questions about Jesus. He hasn't done any work to be able to point to Jesus or bear witness to Jesus. More than bearing witness, he's throwing blame to Jesus. He knows that he's not supposed to be carrying his mat. Most commentators these days say this man is, is, is pointing to Jesus as it's his fault. He's the one who told me to violate the Sabbath. And he's passing blame along there. On top of that, the moment Jesus approaches him in the temple, what is the first thing that he does? He goes right to the authorities that he knows are going to try to punish Jesus. And he tells them who Jesus is. He tells him that Jesus is the one who did it. He points him out. And this begins the conflict that Jesus will have in the Gospel of John. And where it really starts to feel like a negative portrayal is when you look at that outcome. The other signs that we have in the Gospel of John, what's the main outcome? It's that people start to believe in Jesus and they start to follow Jesus. With this sign in John chapter 5 and with this man's response, what's the outcome? People start trying to take Jesus' life. The response that we see here and the outcome of the man's response, it doesn't follow the same patterns as the other signs in the Gospel of John. This man doesn't seem to have been changed. And this idea that he would go to the authorities and point Jesus out. One commentator that I read focusing on this passage said that that fact that the man went to the authorities to point Jesus out, it is either dumb or malicious. Either he's so naive that he can't understand what this is going to begin for Jesus, or there's some sort of malicious behavior there. There's no way that he could have not known what this would start, though. This man, he seems to just take what he can get from Jesus and then goes on with his life. Another commentator says that 
There seems to be no change in his character in this story. He seems to just take the healing from Jesus, but then he has no curiosity about Jesus, no desire to follow Jesus. He just starts looking out for himself, really, and avoiding the blame of carrying his mat on the Sabbath. Now, in a couple of weeks, we'll be talking about another person Jesus heals in the Gospel of John. It's a man who was born blind. And when we talk about his story, the man's response in John chapter 5, the man with taking up his mat and walking who couldn't walk, it becomes more clear that this is not the appropriate response to Jesus' healings that he shows. Because the man who was born blind, he ends up losing everything for Jesus. He's thrown out of the synagogue. His family doesn't really care to stand up for him anymore. He loses everything, but then he willingly, gladly follows Jesus. But the man in John chapter 5, he is healed, and we never really hear from him after he reports Jesus to the authorities again. We don't get any sort of positive ending there. So this man, I don't think he responds appropriately to Jesus' work. But I also think the way he responds is a pretty classic way that people respond to the work of God in their lives. Oftentimes, we can start to think that God's work in our lives is, is really just a way for us to grab more control over our lives. And we can start praying for certain things and praying for really specific things in a way that betrays that really we're just trying to control our own lives. I've mentioned a few times now that I have rheumatoid arthritis, and I've shared some stories about that. And one of the story, stories that I haven't really shared was that when I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, in those early years, the first couple of years that I was diagnosed with this lifelong crippling disease, I had a number of well-meaning Christians approach me and tell me things like, if I just prayed in this certain way, I would be healed. Or they would tell me things like, if I believed in a certain way, in the power of prayer, that I would be healed. I had somebody tell me that there was clearly some sort of sin in my life that I had to take care of. And if I took care of it, I would be healed. Now, I think all these people meant well. I don't think that they were trying to be malicious here. But what this displays is a view of God that I don't think is biblical. We don't control God with our prayers. We don't control what God does and how Jesus works in our lives with our prayers or with our beliefs. That's not the reason we pray. That's not the reason we believe. And we definitely don't just assume that the point of Jesus' work is so that I can control my own health. Jesus is not my cosmic genie doctor out there. And oftentimes that, that belief that God is just here to heal something specific in our lives or to, to, to make this one part of our lives perfect. When we think that that's the point of God's work, we're actually replacing the true living God with our own ideas of control. And it's another way for, of us grabbing control in our lives. I mean, think back to this man who has been laying there for 38 years. He's been trying to be healed. And Jesus shows up in a moment, he heals him. And then the man's done with Jesus. I think that that can start to be what many Christians functionally, in practice, that starts to be how we view God. That we're just going to get something out of this and then we walk away and there's no curiosity. But the point of God's work is not that we would have more control over our lives. Now, as I say this, and we talk about this idea of prayer and praying, and I do believe God works through signs and God works through miracles and that healings do occur. But oftentimes Christians can wonder, why do we pray then? What is the point of praying? If it's not to get Jesus to intercede in our lives in a specific way, what is the point of praying? Why even make any requests? And sometimes Christians can just stop making any requests of God. It can be a damper on our prayer lives. That's an unfortunate response, though. And I think it's easy for all of us to fall into it, but it is unfortunate. 
Now, there's all sorts of reasons that people give for why we should pray, even if our praying doesn't lead to God specifically responding in the way we want God to. And I do think we should be praying for certain requests. I think we should be lifting those requests up to God, but I think it's our motivation that is important behind that. Now, some people have said that praying is good because it just connects you to God and deepens your relationship, and that is true. But sometimes for me, the main reason I pray and the main reason that I ask God for things is simply because that's the model the Bible gives us for prayer. That's just the way people talk to God in the Bible. They aren't trying to control God, though. They're not trying to make God a genie who's just going to fulfill our wishes. But they are trying to persuade God. There's a dialogue. There's a back and forth, a give and take. Go and read the Psalms. And throughout the Psalms, numerous times, the author of the Psalms is trying to change God's mind to get God to intervene in a certain way. And yes, when God doesn't, the writer of the Psalms is usually content with that still. But there's still an attempt to change God's mind. Or I think back to one of the craziest stories in all the Bible to me, which is in Exodus, when Moses has gone up to Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. He's up there for too long, and the Israelites, they get frustrated with how long Moses has taken, and they don't want to wait any longer, so they make a golden calf, and they start worshiping this golden calf. They make an image, and they start worshiping that image. So God becomes so frustrated with the Israelites that God's just going to start over. God's just going to wipe them out and be done with them. That's what God is going to do. But Moses argues with God. Moses debates God. And at the end of the day, Moses changes God's mind. For whatever reason, Moses changes God's mind. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around that. But that's the model of prayer that we get in the Bible. And for me, it's sufficient to just say, that's why we should pray. Because we get this example. And this is the type of relationship Jesus has invited us into. And there's a subtle distinction there. Because on the one hand, we could be praying to God to just give us something that we want, which leads us to control. But on the other hand, we can be praying to God, bringing requests to God, because that's part of what being in a relationship with somebody is is letting them know what you want, letting them know your desires, letting them know what your hopes are, communicating that clearly. And when you look at God's relationship with people in the Bible, God responds the same way. Go and read the prophets. God responds passionately. God wants to be in relationship with Israel. So the reason that I think we praise, it's the model the Bible gives us, and that's just how relationships work. So, I think this man, the main thing that he is missing, this man who was healed there by that pool, the main thing that he's missing is the insight that God's work, it's not there for us to just control our lives, control our health, control the things we want to change in our lives. That's not why Jesus does his work. The main insight that this man is missing is that one of the purposes of God's work is to raise our curiosity about Jesus. The man doesn't ask any questions. He doesn't seem to care too much about Jesus at all. But you look at all the other signs, you look at all the other conversations Jesus has in the Gospel of John that are positive, they all raise curiosity. And this relationship we have with God, where we try to persuade God, where we share our hopes with God, where we let God know where, what we want. It all flows from curiosity. Curiosity about what God will do. Curiosity about what God has done. I think curiosity is one of the most underrated values for Christians. So this man, sadly, Jesus heals him. He walks away and he doesn't show any curiosity, any desire to be in a relationship. He doesn't ask any questions about who Jesus is. May we be constantly asking questions about Jesus, asking questions why Jesus isn't doing something, why Jesus did do something. May we constantly be showing curiosity about who Jesus is. And when Jesus' work shows up in our lives, may we be grateful 
but may it just raise more questions for us about this God that we worship. I think that's one of the main purposes of the signs that Jesus performs. So may we respond with that type of curiosity. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, Stonebridge. I'm Stephanie Leedy, Director of Children's and Family Ministries. I'll be closing us today in prayer. After I begin, there will be a few moments to pray silently. After our silent prayers, I will lead us in the Lord's Prayer, which I invite you to say out loud with me. Now, please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we pray that we would not lose hope in our own waiting. Forgive us for our sins, our need to control, and our discomfort in the unknown. Give us hearts that wait with faith and build in us the assurance that you are in control. Thank you for your grace and patience when we're slow to recognize your activity in our own lives. And Lord, we pray for your peace and joy as we walk by faith and not by sight. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
what you say that you're good and your love is great So before we conclude this service with a blessing, I do want to remind everybody that this is our last online service in this format. The online service is going to be changing throughout the summer. We will still have the sermon provided, but since we are going to two services on the weekends, one outdoors on Saturday night, one indoors on Sunday morning, we are not going to be doing the online service in the same way. And I just wanted to remind everybody of that. So there will be an online service posted Monday mornings from here on out. Um, it is going to look different, though. And we invite you to, to join us outside Saturday evenings um, or indoors Sunday mornings if you feel you're ready and to register for those services. But now as you go from this place, wherever God may call you, may you go curious about Jesus' work. And may the work of God that you see in your life make you more curious about this God that we worship. And may you go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and love the Father. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.